Yes. Um, I will start recording. If any issues is there, you can just check it out, okay? Good evening, everybody. Uh, Department of English and Research Center, Sri Parashakti College for Women, Kutralam, welcomes you all to the fourth day of one week international webinar series on women, gender, literature, core concepts and perspectives. Before going into the session, I would have some uh, general instructions to the participants. Participants, once you enter the Zoom platform, kindly mute your audio and video. To maintain the bandwidth and avoid the network issues, Kindly cooperate us with us to maintain the smooth flow of the webinar. Entry to the Zoom platform will be allowed for 500 participants. Beyond that, other participants who cannot join the Zoom platform can view the sessions through the YouTube, and YouTube link will be shared on basis of the request. Attendance link and feedback link uh, for the day four will be posted only in the chat box of the Zoom after 8 to 15 p.m and you are requested not to ask for the feedback or the attendance link continuously. So and the participants, uh, we also request you not to post any personal details like your emails or phone numbers in the chat box. Kindly use the chat box only for recording your observations, uh, putting your feedbacks or posing your questions. Thank you, cooperate with us, happy learning. We will proceed with today's sessions. Today, we have an uh, eminent speaker with us, uh, Dr. Patricia Austin, Assistant Professor, Institute of English Studies, University of Zizov, Poland. Uh, before uh, her session starts, I would have like to have give a brief introduction to her to the participants. Patricia Austin is an Assistant Professor at the Institute of English Studies, uh, where she teaches Anglophone of literature. In 2013, she received PhD from Warsaw University for her work of Indian writers in English. In her current research, she explores the meeting between eco-criticism, post feminism and post-colonial studies in her reading of contemporary texts. Today, she is going to speak on the topic, the aim of pilgrimage is another pilgrimage, the ethical dilemma in Olga Tokarczuk's flights. I wish uh, uh, Madam to take over the session and welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to join you today uh, from Poland. Uh, and I want to talk this time about a Polish writer um, that uh, made international name uh, last year by winning um, uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature, it's Olga Tokarczuk. And I'm going to talk about her novel translated to English, uh, Flights. Uh, that's the Polish version, Bieguni. Um, uh, she received for this novel uh, uh, in 2018 Man Booker Prize. Uh, and I want to say from the beginning that uh, this um, talk has been partly shaped by my conversation, which I had over about a week or two this summer with three professors from Cambridge University, Simon Perry, Mary Stewart, and Stephen Tradgill. Uh, sorry. Uh, just a minute. Yes, yes. Um, sorry for that. Uh, so uh, we had a very heated conversation and there was a lot of criticism, uh, which sort, sort of counterweighed a lot of praise that the novel has received uh, in the past few years. And I want to address that as uh, as I talk today. Um, actually, can I please ask for the screen sharing and my... Yes, uh, yes. Well, when I can share. Yes, ma'am, give me a second.
Okay, so when we are waiting for the screen, oh, there we go. Thank you. And the next few slides will be uh, quotes from our exchange um, about the novel. So can you please, uh, can I actually move the slides? So can I please ask you to move the slides forward? Yes, yes. Slide show will be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the criticism uh, was connected with the fact that the novel um, celebrates traveling. Uh, the very title flights, um, the title itself suggests uh, travel by aircraft. And this is basically what's happening. Uh, the narrator, um, the narrator tra travels um, across the world. She visits different places. Most of the um, her narrative is happening at the airports where she comes across different people and she shares her observations. But this narrative is also um, uh, uh, crisscrossed by other smaller narratives, other histories that uh, intertwine uh, the main narrative. So we have this kind of fragmentation, uh, sort of like an observation, um, uh, like a travel journal. Um, uh, intersected with other narratives. So uh, the criticism um, basically concerns that, concerns uh, the fragmentation of the novel, the celebration of traveling, especially in the world when we know that not everyone is privileged enough to be traveling, especially by um, aircraft, uh, when we have refugees. Uh, also, we have CO2 emissions coming out of the uh, out of flying, and uh, usually it's the most disadvantaged who suffer the consequences of that. Also, another criticism was connected with the fact that when we are traveling, we never really get to engage with another person um, thoroughly. Uh, we just come across different people and then we um, uh, move on before we can get any uh, meaningful connection. Um, and uh, I want to respond to this criticism by showing that uh, uh, the um, political historical context uh, in Poland, but also what's happening to, today in our world, actually uh, uh, points in a different direction in understanding the novel, uh, understanding travel more metaphorically as, uh, uh, as a thought process uh, rather than activity. Um, and um, um, the, the, what is important to remember is that the novel was published in 2007. That means it was written uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, uh, this is just about one decade after Poland has uh, gotten out of the Soviet occupation. Poland has a long history of occupation, uh, uh, just like India does. In, India was colonized. We were occupied by um, Germans, Austrians, Hungarians, uh, Russians. Um, uh, so really the independence was very short lasting before um, uh, Flights was published. Um, and um, the novel, I would argue, simply the, the main aim of the novel is to test and to stretch the borders of subjectivity and identity. Uh, uh, and as it was being written, it responded to the growing Polish um, uh, nationalism that um, um, was wanted to keep the borders of citizenship within the rigorously defined norms. You have to be Catholic, white, patriarchal, uh, heterosexual to belong to this country. Um, uh, but I would also argue that in the aftermath of the turbulent first two decades of the 21st century and the accelerating environmental crisis, they need to reevaluate personhood and to find ways to move beyond the individual interest to find a sense of community based on truer mutuality seems to be even more urgent uh, than it was at the time it was written. Um, and the novel suggests an alternative model in the figure of the traveler, the nomad. Such, and can you please share uh, the slides forward? Move the slides forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, and uh, yeah, so you can see here her receiving the Nobel Prize. And we need to move on a few more slides, please. 
Please forward to the next slide. Uh, a few more slides. So here you have some quotes from our exchange uh, in Cambridge, um, but maybe it will be available later. I can uh, share those quotes later and we can move on. Please forward, forward. Mm -hmm. Next. Yes, and one more. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So this is the narrow uh, Polish identity that I was talking about. Uh, we have to be um, uh, heterosexual, we have to be uh, Catholic. Um, also, uh, the government is not really concerned about environmental crisis. So like only humans matter, not the rest of the world. Um, yes, and then please continue the slides. Um, sliding forward. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So, um, so Tokarczuk is skeptical of these normative standards of any kind. And uh, in this novel, she turns towards anomalies, deviations uh, from the norms. And these deviations, uh, they are both um, uh, in the way of perceiving reality, but also these could be deviations from bodily appearance, from orientation or any other other deviation from the norm. And she presents an alternative to such sedentary model of life um, uh, in the fact that her protagonists remain in constant motion. They cross borders, both physically and more importantly, they leave behind old, old habits of thought and learn to adapt and revise the relation to those they encounter on the way. And against strict and static definition of citizenship, she portrays a way of imagining community that privileges relationality over geographic belonging. So to be related to others is more important than to belong to a place. Um, and belonging to, a, to such community rather than place also stretches the definitions of personhood to what, uh, especially in the Western thought, have been considered to be in sentient nature and so uh, excluded from our attention. Um, and such nomadic model of life has in fact existed both in European practice and thought. And I'm thinking here about uh, the Roman Romani people who actually uh, their ancestry can be linked back to Northwestern region of India. Um, um, and uh, well, this is an Indo-Aryan ethnic group that spread across territory. That does, and this group does not have a sense of attachment to a specific place of origin. Uh, and this lack, this very lack of a starting point, has profound impact on their social construction. They stand for a community model in which social connection becomes more important than geographic belonging. And as they are not limited by state regulations, prescriptions their social connectivity encompasses that which was frequently left out of the picture in the state um, um, uh, uh, norm. norm. Uh, and Daniel Baker, for example, writes, that's a quote, history of nomadism and the collective experience of life at the edge of state control has resulted in the development of Roma's innate understanding of the value of the makeshift and the associated qualities of movement transition, simultaneity, and adaptability. So situated on the outskirts of society, those Roma people have learned how to be resilient uh, and how to cope with hardships and oppressions. And the way to do it is by building strong social connection um, and also to avoid exclusion. Um, and uh, their way, I would say, I would argue, their way of living represents an attractive alternative model of a society in a world of increasingly more rigid and impassable borders. And one of the first attempts at theorizing this alternative model in Europe in the 20th century was originally published in 1980. And that's a book, uh, and next slide, please. It's the title is A Thousand Plateaus. Um, uh, by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, uh, the French uh, uh, thinkers. And they, uh, in this um, book, in a chapter called Treatise on Nomadology, The War Machine, they conceptualize the nomadic in terms of the relationship to space. So there are two uh, 
two possible approaches to space. One is sedentary, one is nomadic. And the sedentary refers to all that is ordered, categorized, determined, distinguished from others, like a plot of agricultural land. And the nomadic, in contrast, indicates all that's free, unlimited, chaotic, unspecified, like a satellite picture of a desert. Next slide, please. So, so you can see that, like you can see on the, on the left hand side, it's like a um, picture of a desert from the sky where we don't see any borders, any visible um, uh, lines, uh, which is contrasted to the land on the right, which is uh, divided uh, by those lines. Um, so um, while movement across sedentary land requires crossing borders and boundaries, the route is laid out by roads and walls in nomadic movement, uh, in, in nomadic distribution, the movement happens in space without clear borders or exclusive or ownership that comes with the borders. So here journey determines stopping places rather than the other way around. And sedentary distribution has a center around which there form hierarchical relations on the basis of the distance from the center. Um, uh, and also the sedentary model implies belonging to a place, even when a person moves between places but, long, but longs for such belonging. And in nomadic distribution, uh, traveling rather than belonging is a way of relating to that space. So even if a person stays in one place, stays put, but the relation to it is subordinated to the principle of movement, they are still no, nomads. Um, and um, more recently, drawing from the writings of Deleuze and Guattari, Rosi Bredotti, uh, another uh, contemporary thinker, she has adopted nomadism uh, as a creative and critical way of addressing subjectivity against the traditional unitary vision of the self as individual and rational. And next slide, please. Thank you. So Bredotti traces this model to the widely uh, adopted Leonardo da Vinci's The Vitruvian Man as the symbol of bodily perfection, uh, which then doubles as moral, self-reflective, individual, political subject ca capable of rational progress. And this Enlightenment humanism's model, she believes, has served not only individuals, but also entire cultures, and has shaped the perception of Europe that coincides with universalizing powers of a self-reflexive self reason. And this model also um, rests on the dialectic of self and other. And in this uh, relation, the other is everything that does not fit the humanistic ideal. So becomes difference in the pejorative sense, um, uh, which causes exclusions and disqualifications uh, from belonging to, to, to the model, of course. Um, and next slide, please. So this model, ne next one, please. Uh, the validity of this model uh, one more. <laughs> Another slide, please. So, so it began to be questioned in the 20th century, first by post-structuralists who rejected its representation of the autonomous self-determining individual, and later was questioned by the feminist thinkers who, like, for example, Luz Irigaray, uh, observed that the, and that's a quote, abstract ideal of men as a symbol of classical humanity that is male, white, European, handsome, and able-bodied does not represent a statistical global average person, uh, end of quote. So, and it, this model has also been further undermined by post-colonial and environmental scholars. Edward Said, for example, uh, displayed that the ideals of reason, tolerance, equality, coexisted with European practices of violent domination, exclusion, and terror. Um, and post-humanism, which is the latest development in the schools of thought that consider what counts as subject, situates the subject in his or her relationality, embodiment, sexuality, affectivity, empathy, and desire. Um, and Bredotti's strength of post-humanism, which is critical post-humanism, has evolved out of post-structuralist, feminist, and post-colonial roots. Um, uh, but more than the other ones, it stresses the materiality uh, of the subject, uh, the embodiment, and also the embeddedness of the subject uh, in the world. Uh, the post-human subject goes thus beyond individual self-interest. It develops a sense of interconnection with others and is aware of the diver diversity of subject positions. 
and at the same time it, rem it remains grounded materially grounded in a place and so accountable um, so here you see just four different ways to, that we have been playing with the Vitruvian men uh, uh, in the past year. So on the left, you can see the posthuman by Rosie Bredotti. This is actually the cover of her book, uh, where we can see a woman, not a man. And then we see some indigenous uh, version, um, animals. Uh, basically, the, the image has been uh, deconstructed. Um, um, so subjectivity remains one of the most crucial questions for a posthumanist thinker today. Uh, and it must at the same time be understood not as a given, but more like a process, um, um, some kind of co constant continuous negotiation with dominant norms and values. Um, uh, and the subjectivity that emerges is always relational. It always means in relation to the others. And as a result, there is a proliferation of these counter images of the subject. So uh, we have uh, the womanist, queer, cyborg, diasporic, uh, nomadic, natives, etc. All the, that brings into representation what has been, uh, what had been declared off limits um, by the system. Um, um, right. And borders, both physical and conceptual, and movement across them. Um, have been very close to Tokarczuk's own experience. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Olga Tokarczuk um, was born in Silesia. Oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is a picture of uh, 2020. So you can also see that the Vitruvian man has got a new image today with the virus uh, entering us, the virus which is proliferating around us. And we are just uh, sort of like uh, stuck in the middle uh, of it, like so small in comparison to the virus. But next slide, please. So, um, so Tokarczuk, like her, her own experience is a borderline experience. So she, she her, her family home uh, is located in Silesia, which is uh, west, south Poland. It's 200 meters from the Czech border. And her grandmother, um, um, who was born in Lwów, uh, even though she stayed in the same city throughout her whole life, held Austro-Hungarian, Soviet, and then Polish citizenship. So she was stayed, she stayed put, but her citizenship kept changing as the place swept hands. Um, fascinated with the idea of borders in her writing, Tokarczuk has become a guide for just such fluid uh, cartographies and liquid social landscapes. Uh, even though all of her works, to some extent, bigger or less, thematized journey and movement, flights most fully and most straightforwardly displays nomadic sensibility. Uh, the title in Polish is Bieguni, and that's from the Polish verb biegać, which means to run, uh, which, has, which cannot be actually translated uh, into English to keep the same, uh, the same meaning, but it's also a name of a Russian cult uh, called Bieguni, um, according to which one can only escape evil when remaining in constant motion. The moment you stop, this is the moment when the Antichrist Christ can enter you. So you have to keep moving, um, um, uh, right? But in English, uh, the English title, Flights, has many other associations uh, that we um, uh, uh, can connect with movement. Uh, besides the obvious, aircraft journey also means an act of leaving to take flight or an escape, a passage of time, or an extravagant idea like flights of fancy. So all of it indicates um, the movement. And movement is prioritized from the novel's very opening part. Uh, we have an unnamed narrator who remembers her childhood, uh, childhood self, and a moment when she, for the first time, realizes who she is. She realizes um, uh, that she exists on her own. Um, uh, and next slide, please. We have some quotes. Um, so she's sitting in her room and it's dark um, and uh, well, she, uh, the, the child narrator observes the worst part is the stillness, visible, dense, a chilly dusk. So in a complete stillness, the darkness becomes the most kinetic element. And then you have the quote on the top, nothing happens. The march of darkness holds at the door of the house and all the clamor of fading falls silent makes a thick skin like a hot milk cooling. The contours of the buildings against the backdrop of the sky stretch 
out into infinity, slowly lose their sharp angles, corners, edges, and now the dark soaks into my skin. So just as the whole landscape is completely static, nothing happens. It's only the darkness that moves, that progresses, that holds, that marches, uh, that fades. And in the end, it enters her. Like she, she had, she's, she's also part of that static landscape, but she's entered by the darkness. Um, uh, so the darkness becomes internalized by the protagonist in this moment of self-recognition. And from now on, it uh, defines her. And she says, as a second quote, my own presence is the only thing with a distinct outline now, an outline that quivers and undulates. So she sees herself moving and in so doing hurts. And all of a sudden I know there is nothing anyone can do now. Here I am. Uh, so not only does the narrator grow aware of her own distinct existence, but also she realizes it's inextricably connected with movement. Um, it quivers and undulates. So it's by no means static. And this recognition, as we can see, is painful, but also uh, as sex subsequent uh, parts will show rewarding because the movement um, of darkness doubles in the next chapter uh, as a river and the river is unregulated. So it's unpredictable, uh, uh, it's dangerous, but just like that darkness, it also obliterates the contours of the buildings. It blurs the features of the men who drown in it. Yet despite the danger, the narrator realizes that, that's a quote, a thing in motion will always be better than a thing at rest. Change will always be nobler thing than permanence. That which is static will degenerate and decay, turn to ash, while that which is in motion is able to last for all eternity. So the, here the narrator is her adolescent self. So she's a little bit more grown up and she wanders into a bigger space. Like she mm, mm, progressively uh, wanders more and bigger and bigger distance actually uh, as the novel progresses. Um, um, and now she, as she's older, she can consciously adopt and embrace the dynamic over the static, even though she fully realizes what comes with it. Um, uh, and she, um, her idea of movement con is contrasted with that of, of her parents, um, even though they were also not the fully settling kind, as she says, and as a quote, their journeys remained within the same metaphysical orbit of home. They weren't real travelers. They left in order to return, uh, end of quote. Her father's nomadism is ironically diminished to boiling water in a kettle, quote, taking no small pride in the gurgle of the boiling water. He'd, been, he'd then pour over our tea bags at true nomads. We can hear the irony in this quote. Uh, her parents carefully planned each destination and moved from one point to another, which in Duluth and Guattari's understanding would be a part of a migrant life, not of a nomad. Because being a nomad means there is no re-territorialization. A nomad moves in smooth space. Uh, what matters is being between, being in the journey and not arriving in, at certain um, points uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the journey. Um, so as a quote, a path is always between two points but the in-between has taken on all the consistency and enjoys both the autonomy and a direction of its own. The life of the nomad is the intermezzo. So we are in between points uh, in the process of traveling. And the narrator says, um, quote, whenever I set off on any sort of journey, I fall out of radar. No one knows where I am at the point I departed from or at the point I'm headed to. Can there be an in-between? Uh, end of quote. And next, quote, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, there, it's really there, thank you. So living in the smooth nomadic space is also presented as a sign of a higher development um, of civilization, uh, which we can, uh, again, I will go back to it if we can agree with it or question. Um, and that's a quote, fluidity, mobility, illusoriness, these are precisely the qualities that make us civilized. Barbarians don't travel. They simply go to destinations or conduct raids. So, end of quote. So the violence of colonizing or appropriating a space is made um, simply obsolete in the life of a nomad who does not need space to, 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 to own, to possess. But the real danger 
lies in setting for sedentary lives. Uh, there is another um, narrator in the novel, um, uh, a runaway, uh, who says, that's a quote, whoever pauses will be petrified. Whoever stops, pinned like an insect, his heart pierced by wooden needle, end of quote. So here, sedentary life is exemplified by state apparatus, which in this narrative takes the form of an antichrist, quote, he will mark you and record you in his records, provide you with the documentation of your fall. He will turn to your brightly colored soul. He will turn your brightly colored soul into a tiny flat one cut out of paper, end of quote. So subjectivity melts into a paper record kept for the sake of retaining the status quo, a frozen order with a place assigned to each number and maintained through a range of inventions like the institutions of, and offices, stamps, newsletters, hierarchy, ranks, degrees, applications, rejections, passports, numbers, cards, election results, sales, and amassing points. And such machine does not tolerate change. Um, um, this is why, um, and that's a quote, tyrants of all stripes, um, uh, infernal uh, servants, have such deep-seated hatred for the nomads. That is why they persecute the gypsies and the Jews and why they force all the free peoples to settle, assigning the addresses that serve as our sentences." End of quote. So the narrator, uh, basically every single narrator in the novel rejects sedentary life. Um, and about growing roots, they say, I don't know how to germinate. I'm simply not in possession of that vegetable quality. I can't extract nutrition from the ground. I'm an anti Enteus. Enteus was the Greek god who uh, remained invincible as long as he stayed in contact with his mother, who was the goddess Earth. Um, um, but the novel's narrator, in contrast, she draws in energy from movement and not from staying put and uh, growing her roots. And yet movement on a global scale affects changes in most remote localities, which are not always perceived as positive. Uh, in the novel, it's um, portrayed most um, vividly on the example of movement of non-human population, a biologist whose job it is to eliminate invasive species of plants and animals, um, which endanger the uh, local populations. She understands how futile such attempts are in our globalized reality. Uh, and that also brings us closely to the virus and our attempts to, to stopping the virus from spreading today. And next slide, please. Um, so the biologist who tries to stop the invasive species uh, from spreading, she says, plants have slipped out of people's gardens. Just recently, she had seen clumps of blood red geraniums on the side of the road. Garlic had got away and turned feral in the wilderness. People like her worked hard to keep the island from being contaminated by the rest of the world, to keep random seeds from sneaking out from random pockets and landing in the island soil, to keep foreign fungi from banana peels brought in from knocking down the whole ecosystem. And on their shoes, on the soles of their hiking boots, to keep any other undesirable immigrants from getting through, bacteria, insects, algae. It's a battle that must be waged, though of course it's been doomed from the start. You have to make peace with the fact that in the end there won't be individual ecosystems. The world sloshed together in a single sludge. Um, so this global exchange of people, non-human nature and goods cannot be stopped, even if there is a nostalgia for the world of separate cultures. And such world has, however, always been, if we look back, we will see that it's always been a myth as cultures and ecosystems are forever evolving and that which is static will degenerate and decay. Um, and again, from a uh, quote from the novel, change is the only constant. Um, but movement, so, so these uh, are just passages from the novel that show, that focus on movement as a physical activity in this physical mm, process of actually traveling or moving from place to another. But movement also happens, um, uh, or even more importantly happens as a way of seeking more accurate ways of thinking the world. And next slide, please. Um, the narrator talks about, quote, the subtle, pleasure of experiencing 
um, internal, internal, so inside of us uh, motion. I didn't want to have set opinions, which were just excess baggage. Um, that's that's end of quote. So the novel likewise carries out the questioning of received ideas and ideals. It departs from the legacy of enlightenment humanist vision of the human, which is verbalized in flights by the story of Professor Frederick Ruiz, who is a Dutch anatomist of the late 17th and early 18th century. And that um, uh, professor um, anat of anatomy, he says, quote, for men stands at the very center of creation and our world is the human world, not the divine world or anyone else's. Um, and this is being uh, strongly questioned. And uh, the, the novel questions not only this hierarchy, but also the very idea of men, what man is, and probes the limits of subjectivity, but also reveals that there is no solid center. There is no center simply of creation and asks about the capacity of the pronoun our, also in this quote, our world, in the expression our world, like who does the our include? Is it just the humans or is it more than that? So in place of the accepted ideal, the constituted norm of the Vitruvian white male body, the narr narratorial gaze zooms on imperfection. And next slide, please. Imperfection, anomalies, and multiple ways of inhabiting the world. Uh, there is one 19th century uh, narrative in the, in the novel. Um, um, and in that, in that narrative, uh, there is, uh, this narrative ponders over the stuffed body of the educated black slave, Angelo Solomon. Uh, you may have heard about him. Uh, he, he, he was a man who was born as a slave, but then he rose to prominence in the society in Vienna and um, uh, was highly educated, who could play uh, the violin, um, uh, was simply a highly cultured person. And his remains uh, are displayed as an attraction at the Museum of Curiosities in Vienna. And the museum was created by Joseph II to collect, as a quote, everything that was particular, every man manifestation of, of the aberration of the world, every instance of matter forgetting itself, end of quote. And there is a series of letters written to, um, to Caesar Francis I uh, by Josephine Solomon, who is the daughter of Angelo Solomon. And she makes a plea to release the body of her father, to allow him a proper burial, not to be just an exposition in a museum, not just an attraction in a museum. And she appeals, she tries to appeal to all, all these categories that make him human such as his uh, intelligence, education, musical talent. And she tells uh, the story of his life, believing that, quote, what makes us most human is the possession of a unique and irreproducible story uh, that we take place over time uh, and leave behind our traces, end of quote. And she gets a lot more straightforward in her consecutive letters to the Caesar. And referring to her father's race, she writes, and you can see this quote here, it is sufficient for, is it sufficient for another human being to be different, to be, be it outwardly or inwardly, or be it in any other way, for him to be stripped of the rights and customs ordinarily afforded to men? Were those rights conceived and created merely for people who are identical to one another? But the world is full of diversity. Many miles to the south, there are people who are different from those who settled the north. And in the East, there are people who are different from those in the West. What is the point of law that applies only to some? So this is directly an allusion to the um, exclusive Petrovian men um, ideal um, uh, of the Enlightenment humanism. And yet, um, uh, Solomon's daughter observes that Caesar's power over her father stretches only as far as the body. And the quote, the establishment of countries and of boundaries between them demands of the human body that it remain in a clearly delineated space. The existence of visas and passports holds in check the body's natural desire to roam and to move around, end of quote. So, so the Caesar can only rule over the body, not all of the men, but at the same time, um, uh, and that's also a quote, to rule over the body is to truly be the king of both life and death, which is greater than being the emperor or even the greatest country, end of quote. And next slide, please. 
Uh, and what, what she means here is that the body which does not belong to the privileged part of the society will not be properly nourished and will always be at a disadvantage. And in black skins, white masks, Franz Fanon explains that in terms of what he calls sociogeny, that means uh, when a person experiences himself or herself as a deviation from the norm, from the human produced as normal, and that in turn produces physical and psychical reactions and that change the very body. And later, um, so, so in other words, each social order has a culturally prescribed sense of the self and whoever does not fit that model experiences themselves as a defect. And later developing on Fanon's ideas, Sylvia Winter, we have her name be below, she deconstructs the European ideal of a human as a su supra-cultural universal. And like Rosie Braidotti earlier, she traces the origin of this ideal or norm to Renaissance secularization and enlightenment transformation um, and credit it to the presence of the inferior other in relation to which this figure of man over represents itself as if it were the human itself. So she sees um, a need and possibility of retrieving ways of being human beyond such over representation, which can take place in literature or art. Um, and the novel does not accept, of course, such easy binary version of reality. And the narrator, the main narrator in the novel, recollects her lectures at university. Uh, she, she studied, she was a student of psychology at Warsaw University, uh, both the narrator and the writer actually herself. And uh, so she recollects her lectures. And that's the next slide, please. We have a quote, probably. Uh, so at the university, uh, the students were taught that the world could be described and even explained by means of simple answers to intelligent questions that in its essence, the world was inert and dead, governed by fairly simple laws that needed to be explained and made public. If possible, with the aid of diagrams, we were inducted to the mysteries of statistics, taught to believe that equipped with such tools, we would be able to perfectly describe the workings of the world. But that did not convince um, her. And she says, I didn't observe boundaries I would slip into a transfer transference. I didn't believe in statistics or verifying theories, end of quote. And in the novel itself also, instead of statistics, we have um, all these ways of deviation from the, of flight from the norm. So numerous anomalies that attract travelers and the narrator admits to, uh, and there's a second quote here, to being drawn to all things spoiled, flawed, defective, broken, anything that deviated from the norm that is too small or too big, overgrown or incomplete, monstrous or disgusting, shapes that don't hit symmetry, that grow exponentially, brim over, bud, or on the contrary, that scale back to the single unit. My weakness is for teratology and for freaks. I believe unswervingly, agonizingly, that it is in freaks that being breaks through to the surface and reveals its true nature. And we have numerous uh, accounts of cabinets of curiosities that are being visited in the course of the novel. Uh, and examples, so, so that's in those cabinets of curiosities, we can find examples of such um, uh, freaks. Um, uh, we have curved spines and ribs uh, in ribbons, deformed bodies, skulls with growths, bullet holes, bones wrecked by Ephrates, um, quote, Evidently, there was someone who recognized that these freaks of nature were owed immortality and that only what is different will survive, because we don't um, uh, show um, in those cabinets anything that's normal, only what's not, what does not belong to norm. So just as these anomalies to the norm are given new life in the museum, Tokatruk opens up subjectivity beyond enlightenment ideal and creates a world in which there are multiple ways of being multiple ways of becoming. The novel's leitmotiv, which is in the title of my talk today, The Aim of a Pilgrimage um, is Another Pilgrim, um, points to the fact that instead of uh, traveling from point to point, a physical place to a physical place, we travel to encounter those other people who are uh, in various ways of becoming um, uh, and being. So that includes fellow travelers breathing the same air on the plane, 
economic migrants, refugees, specimens uh, displayed in these museums, but also plants and earth herself. Um, um, and uh, at one moment in the novel, there is a, young a story of a young couple who's hitchhiking in I Iceland, and they are stuck in the middle of nowhere at night. Uh, and um, there is no place for them to hide, so they have to just sleep out uh, in the open. And they uh, discover at night that the earth is alive. And as a quote, they saw, and the next uh, slide, please. They saw faces in the lava stones, and everything started whispering, murmuring, rustling. It turned out that all you had to do was reach under the moss, under the stones, in order to touch the earth, which was warm. Your hand could feel distant, delicate vibrations, some far of movement, a breath that could be no doubt. The earth was alive." Uh, end of quote. Uh, but to see the earth as alive requires quite a leap of thought, and yet, just as with dark matter, we just believe to occupy three quarters of the universe, uh, quote, a thing we know exists, but we, without being able to access it with any instrument, and, end of quote, the boundary between life and non-life becomes um, here simply obsolete, especially when we um, uh, admit that all matter is vital. And one character in the novel believes that every atom of organic matter contains powerful force, and that is what pushes the world forward. And you can see in the second quote here, it's a force there is no physical evidence for, for the time being. You can't catch it on even the most precise microscopic images, nor in photographs of the atomic spectrum. It's a thing that consists in bursting open, thrusting forward, in constantly going beyond what it is. That is the engine that drives changes, a blind and powerful energy. And uh, this energy was noticed and uh, um, uh, theoretized already in 1987 by Deleuze and Guattari, who recognized that such material vitalism exists everywhere, only in some cases it's more visible than in others. And later in 2010, um, by, in Vibrant Matter, Jean Bennett be believed that the perception of matter as inanimate is one of the major impediments to developing an ecological sensibility necessary to live more ethically. Um, and Jean Bennett, attempts to stretch the concept of agency, action, and freedom to what, in European tradition especially, um, has been considered to be inanimate. And despite the difficulty of translating the vibrancy of matter into human terms and human understanding, such exercise allows to dissolve the boundary between the human and non-human by underlying our shared uh, vital materiality. And this uh, exercise is carried out in flights uh, by, among others, entromorphizing the earth and other elements of the inanimate world. For example, after spring, um, uh, the earth, quote, and that's the next slide, please, had yet uh, to come back to its senses. You, you had to wait until it finally gave itself to plow and hoe. Um, and uh, there are other quotes that anthropomorphize um, uh, nature, like the river paraded, concerned only with its hidden aims beyond the horizon, and it paid no attention, caring only for itself. Um, actually, anthropomorphizing is a, a very uh, controversial um, way of dealing with the non-human, uh, because it, is, it means attributing human form or personality to, to a non-human, so it can be seen as uh, projecting a world understood in human scale, dimension, interest, and desires, uh, but uh, onto the non-human. But paradoxically, it may work against anthropocentrism uh, in a twofold way, actually. Um, firstly, it indicates that whether the character described as a person or a thing, either can have agency. So there is no difference between those two. Uh, and the hierarchy between them disappears. But even more importantly, um, and that's what Timothy Clark says, um, to consider a certain description as anthropomorphic means relying on a set of assumptions as to what anthropos itself stands for. Uh, so what really it means to be human. Post-humanists today deconstruct one by one the qualities that had been until recently, especially in the Western world, believed to make a right holding individual person distinct. And those qualities that would define the human would be the la language, 
you can talk, you have your own language, agency, rationality, and sentience. Uh, but this image of what constitutes a person has been projected um, worldwide uh, onto all that fall under the umbrella of humanity. And anthropomorphism, instead of projecting human att attributes onto the non-human, may, uh, in this sense, paradoxically, help deconstruct the very idea of the human by showing that also the non-human has agency, language, rationality, or sentience. And such a deconstruction is carried out literally in the novel when the Dutch anatomist um, Frederick Rouge is dissecting a body of a young woman. Uh, um, and quote, with these round gestures, he was transforming the human essence into a body and therefore our eyes undressing it of mystery, breaking it down into prime factors as though taking apart a complicated clock. Um, and here, Next slide, please. Here, interestingly, the essence of the person uh, cannot be separated from their body, similarly to um, how Spinoza, uh, another European philosopher, understands the substance as being one with God or one with nature. Um, um, and the novel unearths Spinoza's writings on ethics to provide a model for the post-anthropocentric li living. The late 17th century anatomist Philip Verheyen Verheyen, who studies uh, his preserved amputated leg, most clearly represents Spinoza's ethics in the novel. In the letters to his leg, which he writes to his leg, he um, attempts to prove that, quote, since the body and soul are in essence one and the same, since they are two attributes of an infinite, all encompassing God, there must be between them some sort of proportionality designed by the creator. And what, end of quote. And what is more, like Spinoza, Verheyen rejects the idea that reason and logic can provide um, the whole picture of reality. Um, so what we thought is human may simply be also very limited. So just as the body and soul cannot be separated as they are part of the same substance, the same might be true about anything else that exists. Um, uh, the, the lines we draw may not reflect the underlying reality. Uh, and um, uh, new materialists, material eco-critics, and post-humanist scholars are today advocating such view of undivided nature, where everything is made of the same vital substance. Um, um, uh, and overall, since all that exists is made of the same matter, there is no separation between humans and the non-human nature. This separation simply becomes um, uh, deconstructed. Um, and um, um, uh, and Another way this deconstruction is carried out um, uh, in the novel um, is by presenting the human body in terms of nature, uh, uh, ima imaginary, Im imagery, sorry. For example, there is um, uh, um, on the cover of the Polish book, we can see uh, there is a head, a human skull. I don't know if we can see it or not. It's probably the next slide. Uh, there is a human head with uh, veins visible in it. Let's probably one another. One more slide. Oh, okay, so maybe I didn't put that. Okay, sorry. So uh, there is a head of a um, of a human being uh, with vines that look like river, and there are many such instances where human body is shown in nature uh, imagery. Um, oh, there, there we go. Yes, that's exactly what they meant. Yes, uh, you can see like the veins resemble river tributaries. Not uh, they are even blue, not uh, not red. Um, and um, well, it is arguable to what extent matter can be perceived as sentient and human and non-human life as equal. Uh, I think we can all argue about that today. Uh, what is, if, if it's ethical to talk about the non-human life as, as important as human life when so many humans are suffering worldwide. But what is certain is that material post-humanist thought has profound consequences for the ethical engagement of the world and our right to use or abuse its resources, whether animate or inanimate. It calls to question human exceptionalism and mas mastery, and therefore our right to take advantage of what had been thought of as lower in the hierarchy. And what is more, the boundary um, is questioned. So, and so is the human separation from the rest of nature and our mutual entanglement with one another becomes more prominent. Um, and in fact, the novel uh, symbiotic relations uh, in na nature are portrayed as more advanced model than that of human individualism. Um, 
And next slide, please. Uh, this is also where one of the protagonists, a biologist, negates the concept of evolution uh, based on the survival of the fittest. It's not about the individual and his or her survival. It's about um, now moving forward uh, in it together. So uh, ne next slide, please. Uh, so the biologist says Darwin read this energy as well as he could, but he still read it wrong. Competition, schmumpetition. The more experienced a biologist you become, the longer and harder you look the, at the complex structures and connections in the biosystem, the stronger your hunch that all animate things cooperate in this growth and bursting, supporting one another, permit one another to make use of them. It is true that the tree branches jostle one another out of the way to reach the light. The roots collide in the race to water source. Animals eat one another. But there is in all of this um, a kind of accord. It's just an accord that men find frightening. So the idea of the survival of the fittest, the fight for survival is uh, also deconstructed and it's all about um, uh, mutuality and uh, being in it together, um, growing forward, going forward together. So rel relationality, connectivity becomes more visible um, in this uh, passage, but also in the very act of traveling, being in motion not only requires departure from one sense of self, but also uncovers our dependence or on the other pilgrim. Um, uh, uh, when we leave our home behind. Traveling is thus a search for the other, a readiness for an encounter and an act of acknowledging a mutual dependence. Um, so movement in flights does not just happen in geographical space, but more importantly, uh, in the mental one, it creates the right conditions for such relationality um, and prepares us for new encounters. Um, and just to finish, um, uh, I, 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 I think that this is interesting that uh, uh, as I was working on this novel, uh, COVID-19 virus has been wreaking havoc in Europe and in the world, um, making all the headlines um, because it actually negated the very separatedness of um, humans from nature, uh, humans from one another. We are it showed how vulnerable and how strongly connect interconnected we are. Uh, despite all the strict protective measures, closed, closely guarded state borders, the virus very quickly spread across the globe and entered into reaction with immune systems of thousands, millions actually of individual human beings, uh, proving that the inside, outside of the human and the nation cannot be so clearly um, defined. Um, and, um, and also um, uh, to, to end, I want to show you the last slide which is obvious here. This is a quote from Mary Stewart uh, from Cambridge who actually defended the novel. And I think she understood uh, uh, the, um, um, the historical context and the, the intention of the writer um, um, very clearly when she says, uh, turn that about and the search to avoid the deadness of materialist culture and commodification. Of course, that sounds elitist, dismissive of mundane lives, though not so surprising in an ex-communist culture where the rule book was all, where even history seemed to have a preordained narrative arc. The, this work resists just that. I agree that there are no fully developed stories, but many of the tales included have more depth than you allow. I don't see even the oddest of them as satirical or dismissive. There is a more um, a constant eye for the strange and undervalued, the neglected, the written off, the nonconformist. I detect sympathy for those who seek freedom over deadening routine, even at great costs, for those who have lost their map of how to read their own life, who long for Kairos, for God of opportune time in a world all too predictable, for women, especially as modeled severally here. The text surely resists and mocks the deadening hand of Blau, the would-be plastinator that celebrates those who seek to invest human form of dignity, the daughter of Josephine Solomon seeking redress for her father, the risk taken to return Chopin's heart to his beloved homeland. So let me finish with that and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, can we take some questions? Uh, Am I audible? Can we take some questions? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, okay. Um, uh, I could receive a few questions from the participants. Can you comment on the movement of uh, thinking away? 
Movement of what? Movement of thinking away. Thinking um, away. We, I don't understand. Uh, the question is I'm just, uh, she has not completed, I think so. Um, the next question. Um, in the conclusion, are you saying that the nomads as well as other people have their own rights to live in a way they want to? Uh, that the nomads have the right to live just as other normal people, that's the question. Yes, yes. Um, yes, I mean, that's what the novel is trying to show, like being a nomad, like it, it makes a point for uh, um, appropriating the mentality of a nomad in our sedentary lives. We don't have to leave our houses. We don't have to just get a bundle of clothes and food and just go um, and, and travel. Uh, it's about um, um, being able to leave behind the security of our um, worldview behind and to be open to, to, to encounter the, the other person fully uh, without prejudices that we have been uh, that have been inbred in us. That's how I understand it. So it's more like not really that we have to just leave our houses, but we have to leave the uh, the houses of our um, um, old thoughts and static ways of thinking that we just took um, from the other generations. Yes. Um, usually nomads are seen to be criminals. What do you have to say about it? <laughs> uh, if you think about the Romani people, yes. Uh, in Poland we also have uh, some uh, cases of uh, Roma crime, it's true. Uh, um, and again, I have to say that this is a, more like a um, um, metaphor for uh, thinking. Um, uh, you, I guess you have to be a, a bit of a um, criminal or a, a bit of an anarchist to have the courage to oppose what's wrong. Uh, and I'm thinking here, like we have in Poland right now a lot of uh, protests and strikes um, uh, against uh, curtailing of women's rights, um, um, or um, uh, there are a lot of protests for um, getting off coal, which our government is promoting as uh, the national treasure. We have to use coal despite the growing CO2 emissions. So that's the, the kind of a criminal I'm thinking about. Uh, next question. Uh, state always asks for obedience and subservience, and nomads don't conform to these structures. Can this be the reason for uh, astrocism of nomads? Mm, absolutely, yes, they do not obey, so that's that could be why they are. Um, uh, that's I also mentioned in my talk, they are very uncomfortable for uh, the state of, of offices, right? state apparatus, they are very uncomfortable because they are not so easily contained and categorized. So um, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, you spoke about Polish identity in relation to the book in the beginning. Could you please elaborate on it? Yes. Um, um, like, you know, since the 18th century, Poland has been under occupation. Um, like we uh, were taken by the Russian. I mean, we basically gave away the country to the Russians, the Germans, and um, uh, the Austrian Hungarians, um, and that lasted until the World War One. Uh, we were under occupation, so the Poland basically disappeared from the map uh, for uh, for a long time, and then after. Um, then we had a small, uh, a short period of time when Poland was independent until World War II. And after World War II, what happened? We had a Soviet occupation. I mean, it wasn't, um, uh, we, we legally, I mean, officially, Poland was an independent country, but was under the Soviet rule uh, until 1989. Um, so after 1989, the borders finally opened and there was this huge uh, euphoria with all things Western, all things global, all things American. Uh, and that euphoria um, basically produced two things. Uh, one thing was the, the coming in of foreign influence, foreign culture into, into Poland that was very homogeneous by then because the borders were closed. Um, and second thing it produced was the fear for national um, 
uh, identity uh, because as the borders opened and everything started changing so rapidly, uh, uh, there were fears that we would lose our identity as Polish nation. Um, uh, and that, uh, so it went in two different directions that were like sort of completely uh, opposing one another. Um, and I think this is why in early 2000, uh, like 2007, 8, uh, strong nationalist movements started uh, forming in Poland because they were afraid for the um, national unity and culture. Um, but at the same time, you, it's impossible to stop it, to stop globalization at this point uh, because of the open borders and because Polish people have moved outside the borders and the, the, the Western culture has moved back to, has, has simply appeared in Poland. So it has shaped um, the way the country is today. But it's a very difficult um, uh, moment, I think, for my country right now. Uh, can you find a trace of Poland's history in the characters of Olga's novels? In the characters of what novels? Um, yeah, history in the characters. Trace of Poland's history in the characters of Olga's novels. Uh -huh. um, Yes, like in 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 this novel, in flights. Um, yes. uh, for example, there is a history of Chopin, Frederick Chopin, who was the composer, one of the most famous romantic Polish pian piano composers, and there is the story of um, his um, heart being uh, smuggled to back to Poland uh, in the folds of a woman's dress. She she wants she she has the heart of Chopin in a jar, and she wants him to come back to Poland to be buried in the Polish uh, on the Polish land, but she cannot do it officially. So she takes uh, puts the jar in the folds of the skirt. You know the skirts are very long and full of folds, and that's how she smuggles the heart. So where we have uh, like this need to be back in the motherland, which is so strong that uh, you can even smuggle somebody's heart. Um, well, there are many also instances of, I mean, the, um, of characters who complain about Poland being this gray, uh, uh, sad, uh, poor country. And this is what Poland really was like between, uh, before 1989, when we were uh, under communist rule. Um, it was this very, very like, bleak kind of um, um, environment to live in. So there are a lot of um, stories like that. And, and those who want to escape that, who know that outside the borders, you can find something much more exciting. Um, uh, but again, this is the, the, the thing, um, the, the, the euphoria I was talking about, the contrast between the bleak communist landscape and the um, shiny Western world. <laughs> Um, okay, can, we can take one more question. What is the difference between uh, anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, anthropomorphism is just a way of presenting what is not a uh, human uh, in human terms, right? So you have, um, I don't know, a tree and you show the tree as being able to talk, uh, to feel something, being like a character in the story with a voice. Uh, and anthropocentrism is to, to look at this tree in human terms. Like you, you only see perceive the tree um, 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 from the human perspective. Um, and, um, and, and this anthropocentrism is this inability to look at the tree from the perspective of the tree. But uh, I talked about uh, last time in my webinar, the other webinar I was talking about Richard Powers' overstory. And I will just show you the cover. This is um, a novel that greatly um, mixes those two things together, anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism, because it has trees that are given voice, which is not human voice, which is not an, uh, anthropomorphic. So this novel is not anthropocentric because it shows trees from the perspective of a tree, not from a perspective of the human. It tries to give the tree a voice, which is a tree voice, not a human voice. So that would be the difference. One is just trying to give the human attributes to something, and the other one is to look at other things only in human terms. Okay. Uh, we have a few more questions, so I'll take only one final question. Uh, has colonialism led to hybrid culture in Poland? Did colonialism lead to what? Uh, 
led hybrid culture in Poland? A hybrid culture? Um, not so much. Um, uh, I mean, we have, I mean, actually it has, when I think about it, uh, when you move to different parts of Poland, depending who was the colonizer of that part of Poland, uh, you can see different uh, architecture, even language. Um, uh, I just came back from northeastern Poland, a region called Mazur, and you can still see names of certain towns in German, and you can see German architecture there. Um, um, and uh, there are also a lot of Soviet influences. If you go to Warsaw, uh, in the very center of Warsaw, there is the Palace of Culture and Science, which is a very strongly Soviet, like it's like a big brick, um, uh, like, a, like, a very, like a block of, or a brick, a very heavy set. So we have it definitely in culture, in architecture, in language, um, we have these influences. Um, yeah, I believe so, but they are, um, the Soviet especially are being repressed by the Polish and all these monuments, Russian monuments are being uh, like um, removed or uh, redone. Um, there's so, so there are some traces, but I'm not sure if I would call it hybrid hybridism because um, they are more like leftovers and um, for sure, it shows in language, it shows in some aspects of culture, but I would say that uh, mm, to a large extent it's being repressed. Yes. Uh, can you just uh, tell the name of the book now, which you showed now, or participant is asking? It, it's the overstory. And the name, uh, oh, you can probably not see it because it's the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's got. <laughs> so it's the, the overstory, and the name oh. of the. Richard Powers, like power, but powers. It uh, won a Pulitzer Prize last year, so you can check that. Who won the Pulitzer Prize? The title will show up. So we could receive so much of appreciation for your presentation, Austin. You can see that in the chat box. Uh, uh, so wonderful uh, presentation, insightful presentation, very valuable presentation. Uh, thank you. Really, it was wonderful listening to you. So uh, we, we should thank you so much for accepting our consent and uh, giving the consent to be here and your own time. Uh, thank you so much. It was really wonderful listening to you. Thank you. It was great. Pleasure. Was really thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Good day. Participants, we shall begin with this next session. Um, can you please check the second session? This was person has arrived. This person has marshaled you. Madam, are you in? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, yes, please. Uh, we shall proceed, ma'am. Good evening, good evening. If you have any slides to share, you can just uh, proceed with that. Uh, okay, I'll just introduce you before. Okay. So here we have Dr. A. Batmashini, Assistant Professor of English from to SRNM College Satur uh, for our second session of today. Uh, she's going to take or, or speak on the topic women in subaltern studies. Uh, I would like to have uh, say a few words about Madam. Um, so she is from this SRNM College and her area of specialization is Indian writing in English and comparative literature. And she's also having an interest in the soft skills uh, and uh, communication skills in two. Um, so her, she has uh, defended her PhD in uh, Chitra Banerjee, Dwaparani, uh, and Tilakavati, a comparative study. Um, so she has wide range of experience and have uh, published so much of research papers uh, and has been resource person, a chairperson in various uh, national and international uh, conferences and seminars. So I had a wide uh, 
uh, pack of achievements, getting so much of uh, uh, awards and uh, getting the best paper award, uh, best title award, and so many publications, so many presentations, uh, and her wife of research is really good. Uh, so we are really uh, uh, happy to have you here, ma'am. Uh, I wish we can take over the session and uh, continue there. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your elaborate introduction. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be part of this webinar to deliver my lecture on women-centered studies. First of all, I want to convey my heartfelt gratitude to the organizing secretary, Dr. Kartika Madam, for giving me this incredible opportunity. Thank you, Madam. I also thank the management principal and the head of the Department of English of Sri Parasakti College for Women, Kutrala. I'm overwhelmed to watch the tireless work of the organizing team of this international webinar for the past three days. I congratulate the entire team for their magnificent works. So that will eventually bring grand success of this webinar series. Once again, I thank everyone. I have chosen my topic as women in subaltern studies. Being born as a woman, I always feel studious to speak about women. So how a woman could be defined? Women can be defined in many ways. There are so many definitions for women. There are so many biological definitions, social, cultural, psychological, anthropological, and political definitions for women. So those definitions try to portray the women in different angles, in different views. That is why everyone is much anticipated to talk about women, women's women studies, women focused studies, women centered studies. Everyone is much interested. Without women, we cannot imagine any society. Any society cannot flourish without women, without the help of women. When a female is born in the society, she is observed as an inferior. She is observed as an inferior. She is observed as being inferior in this universe. So that is why so many female infanticide, feticide, geno genocides, genital mutilations are practiced against female children in this society. These are all really a great curse to the empowerment of the society. Women would be identified based on her submissive, passive behaviorism or mannerism in this male chauvinistic world. First, she depends on her father, then she has to depend on her husband. Later, until her death, she is enslaved by her son. This is the realistic Excuse situation me, of any woman. Excuse me, ma'am. Is the slides have to be moved? Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, I'm going to do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Just I'll just. Okay. So this is the realistic situation of any woman in the society. When she acquired awareness about her own individual freedom, she started to rebel in the community after the popular movements like feminism. She raises her voice in the literature through her autobiographical exploration when there is no space for her in socio-psychological cultural and political aspects. The secret of success of any nation lies beyond the emancipation and the empowerment of women. If the women are treated 
and protected well in the world countries, we can automatically visualize the mega success of the particular nation. The bureaucracy of the government would transparently reflect the greenery effect in the administrative policies if the women are respected. When we talk about the respect of women, when we talk about the respect of women, women were honored in the early Vedic time period. They were given equal status with the men in the Vedic society. History, history says that the great emperor Ashoka had sent his sister Sangamitra to Ceylon to spread Buddhism. The educated Vedic woman had a voice in the selection of her husband in marriage, but in the medieval time period. During the medieval time period, all the women were ill-treated. They have been observed as objects by their male counterparts. Her duty became domestic. She has been utilized for taking care of her home and the procreation of the offsprings. Polygamy became popular in the medieval society, whereas polyandry was admitted in the Vedic society. In Mahabharata, Draupadi Panchali was allowed to marry five men. Women were celebrated as weaker section in all the ages. Physically, mentally, they have been considered as weak comparing to men. But the modern women writers try to prove the above mentioned statement as wrong in feminist connotation. Women are discriminated based on their color, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, region, religion, and language. The women writers throw light on the issues in subaltern studies. Charles Brandt, who wrote the popular novel Janaya, it is a popular novel in English literature. Brandt, Charles Brandt is a British writer. She focuses more on the problems of the protagonist Jan, who is basically from the dominant white community. In the novel, there is a character named Petta, Petta Mason. She has been described as a mad woman by the writer. Jean Rice, in her work, Wide Sargasso Sea, focuses more on the character Petta Mason because she hails from Jamaica, West Indies. She, uh, she is a marginalized character. Since she is a marginalized character, she focuses more on her. And uh, she has written the quoted text as an extension of Brand's novel filling in the missing testimony and the issues over which Brandt glosses. Jean Rice asked many questions to Charles Brandt in the work Why the Sarkas OC? Why? Why the character Petta alone be mentioned as a wild beast in the novel? She is no, she's not a mad woman. Culturally, she had been brought up like that when she was in West Indies. Jean Rice supports Petta because she is a West Indies woman. Half, she is a half black and she is half white. She considers Charles Brandt Jean Rice considered Charles Brandt as her, as her professional rival because she traces out, she traces out only the ordeals of the white girl, Jan Ayer alone in the novel, not the on the not on the mad woman, Petta. We can very well understand the apartheid conflict of the two writers, Brandt and John Rice, from their works, from their respective works. Jean Rice is the supporter of black feminism. Pertha has been ill-treated by her husband, Rochester, in the novel. So she started to live like an animal. The sufferings of Pertha was taken as a serious issue in the book, The Mad Woman in the Attic. 
So we shall move on to the slides now. Uh, so I have chosen most important subaltern women writers for my presentation. So in the picture, Toni Morrison, one of the towering novelists is here. Gayatri Spivak, Naval El Shadavi, Flora Navapa. The, they are some of the most, they are significant subaltern writers. So we are going to discuss some of the works of them. The term subaltern originated from the Latin roots. Subaltern is, it, it talks about only the ruling class community. It not talks about all others, those who are oppressed, those who are marginalized. So the term describes the people who are subordinate in terms of rank, class, caste, gender, race, etc. So the marginalized, oppressed people are more focused in the subaltern studies. The term subaltern assigns the people who are really socially, politically, geographically outside of the ruling power structure of the colonial homeland. In the colonialism, the colonial nation, they had been discriminated. So they, they started to explore their own way of writing. Subaltern consciousness is the most significant characters, characteristics of the theme subalternity. So this diagram shows the disparate subaltern women. They do not have they do not have homogeneity. They do not have homogeneity in their nature. So in their presentation, they do not have homogeneity. They have, they are heterogenetic in nature. So there are many points related to disparate subaltern women. Racial discrimination is the most important theme which had been chosen by the female writers to discuss in their novels. Xenophobia, social injustice. There were a lot of injustice happened for all the writers, for all the women in the subaltern societies. Conflict is the most important term which is related to all the subaltern women. Denial of basic rights. They do not have, they, they are not enjoying with their rights. No rights, basic rights for them. Denial of basic rights. It's a very big question. Then they had been ill-treated. Ill Bullying is, is a concept related to the subaltern women. They had been ill-treated in the society. Difference. There is no equality in the society. Inequality is popular in the subaltern society. Discrimination based on the skin color. Gender stereotypes. Then... They had been excluded. They are, not, they are not included in the society. Always they feel alienation, exileness in the society. Favoritism, nepotism, lot of discrimination shown on the women based on their gender, color. They are facing age, sex. They had been discriminated. So favoritism is shown in their society. Sexual harassment. They had been harassed sexually they had been abused by the dominant society in the in the uh, subaltern societies in the subaltern communities apartheid is a popular term related to subaltern studies and uh, there are many things we can talk about so many themes which are related to disparate subaltern women gayatri spivak she is the most popular writer and uh, she focuses more on subaltern theme. So she wants, she's the first person, she's, she's the first person to use the term subaltern for the colonized, oppressed people. She, uh, 
she raised her voice for the working class women in the colonized oppressed society so that is the speciality of the writer the concept of subaltern studies is derived from marxism post colonialism the entire subaltern literature covers so many themes such as masses dalit study dalit literature dalit literature is a popular literature it is related to subaltern study the uh, the deprived the deprived literature unrecognized studies marginalized literature neglected and indigenous sections of study indigenous literature are part of the subaltern literature so when we focus on subaltern literature we can talk about the, uh, this uh, we can talk about so many literature mask a group of literatures or their dalit literature deprived unrecognized marginalized neglected indigenous literature everything comes under subaltern literature when they do not get recognition in the society they started to raise their voice in the society gayatri spivak asserts that the subaltern subject is always heterogeneous it is not homogeneous because subaltern writers hail from different parts of the world they have their own tradition they have their own cultural practices they have their own customary ways of behaving so automatically uh, the subaltern subject became heterogeneous it is not homogeneous according to gayatri spivak Antonio Gramsci is the uh, popular person who talks about subaltern studies. We are going to analyze the views of Antonio Gramsci in subaltern studies. The term subaltern always denotes the inferior rank people. Oh, it is of inferior rank. It always denotes inferior rank people. Not it, it is not talking about the superior rank people. it refers working class people in soviet union antonio gramsci refers the term for the working class people in soviet union because they had been denied access to the hegemonic power they were not allowed to enter into the active politics they are they are not uh, going to act as a ruling power in that particular country so that time he was find on the subaltern studies antonio gramsci Gramsci was interested in the historiography of the subaltern classes. So, when he was much interested in the subaltern studies, he started to trace out the history of the real historiography of the subaltern classes, because class became evident among the subaltern groups. So, tracing the historiography is not an easy thing. It became the complex, like history of the dominant classes. So according to him the history of the subaltern classes was very complex like the history of the dominant classes since they hail from different part of the world the history the tracing the history of the subaltern classes is not an easy one it became very complex for uh, antonio gramsci and uh, subalterns are always subject to the activity of the ruling groups Uh, they are not considered as a core group they are considered as others all others they are considered as all others so they became always subject to the activity of the ruling group according to the views of the historian the subaltern studies uh, defined as an attempt it is an attempt to allow the voice of the oppressed people to speak within the pages of elitist historiography because they cannot raise their voice in the ruling hegemonic power so subaltern study is act as a tool for all the writers of subaltern literature okay, they are raising their voice so the oppressed people raising their voice in their literature according to the views of historians already we came to know that we cannot find equality in subaltern society inequality is familiar in subaltern society 
all the colonized nations of the world have subaltern identities the colonized nations of the world have subaltern identities each and every colonized nation has their own subaltern identity subaltern literature focuses mainly on freedom and the abolition of slavery segregation lynching migration the women's suffragette movement or much more focused by the marginalized writers so subaltern women literature is dominated by autobiographical spiritual narratives already we came to know that all the writers all the women writers in subaltern studies or trying to trace out their own autobiographical experiences the autobiographical autobiographical experiences of the writers had been explored by them in their own writers in the subaltern studies so it is more dominated by autobiographical when we talk about uh, spiritual narratives uh, african studies or more popular for tracing out the spiritual narratives uh, mythology uh, african mythology is not understood by anyone because there are so many african nations all the african nations are popular for using their spiritual narratives in a different way each and every african nation has its own mythology so understanding uh, the subaltern world, uh, women literature is different is difficult because it is dominated by autobiographical autobiographical traces and spiritual narrations automatically it explores the issues of freedom when they were not having their own rights and uh, they are already the nail of freedom is there so they explore the issues of freedom rights equality which had been long denied to women in the society hybridization in the cultural follow up uh, big sing up of hybridity in culture is very popular in all the subaltern societies subaltern women are caught between the dual identities they ca they can able to follow neither their own native culture they cannot fit into western migrated practices and uh, they are in dilemma whether to follow their own native culture or fit into western migrated practices so automatically there is hybridity in their follow up culture and uh, they long for their own sense of belonging in colonized nation they feel alienated they feel alienation they wanted to go back they wanted to move back to their own country which is not possible that time so sense of longing longingness is there in for all the colonized nation colonized people so understanding subaltern mythology is the important backdrop backdrop against reading subaltern women writing according to henry louis gates subaltern mythology cannot be understood in an easiest way so according to henry louis gates it is a important backdrop to understand the reading of subaltern women writing mythical elements trace the novels from the native tradition and it provide a cultural bridge between the history of their origination and the reality of their life in their settled places so when they carry the mythical elements which is their native tradition 
automatically provides a cultural bridge between the history of their origination so so automatically it shows the reality of their life in their own settled places richard wright wendelon brooks they always talk about racial segregation and black nationalism hardship of depression world war 2 refocused subaltern literature and art towards social criticism and petre is the popular black woman writer her novel popular novel street highlighted the struggles of working class black women in the place called harlem gwendolyn brooks she is also she is also the popular writer black woman writer all her works dealt with everyday life in black or urban communities uh, heterogeneity of lifestyle had been practiced by the black urban community people all her works dealt with everyday life in the black urban community or uh, black urban communities and she received the pulitzer pulitzer prize first florine hansberry is the most noteworthy novelist black woman novelist her work a raisin in the sun it brought a broad outlook of the struggles of black people in the united states to abolish the institution of slavery the civil rights movement had already been started so all the black women writers they started to produce their creative work of art after involving in the civil rights movement Dolan Perkins Valdez she is the most important writer in subaltern studies rent is the most popular novel written by her in the novel there are four enslaved women they act as mistresses to their masters so they are enslaved women the enslaved women are acting as mistresses to their masters so degradation of women happens in the entire novel they had been degraded by their own master they had been repeatedly abused by their master protagonist of the novel is lissy she falls in love with her master emotionally the protagonist lissy she falls in love with her master emotionally though he started to treat her in a uh, ill mannered way she starts to love him she falls in love with him emotionally all the women slaves in the novels were treated as wild beasts by their master they were not even treated as human beings they were treated as wild beast lucy the protagonist she never though she had been repeatedly abused repeatedly ill treated by her master she never likes to give up her affection towards her master whereas the other slave women they have much they are much hatred towards their master they do not like him they wanted to escape from that worst situation they had been kept in the dark room they had been locked inside the dark room the man the master of them were not allowed the master the uh, was not allowing them to move out from their house so the situation forced them to be with the man already they have enslaved by him so here we can apply the marxist theory the four enslaved women had been treated as the commodity they have been treated as objects their body had been enjoyed by their master so they had been treated as the commodities the master is enjoying their enjoying the commodity so this exploitation must be stopped the other noteworthy writer we are going to see nawal el shadavi she is nawal el shadavi is an egyptian popular feminist writer and she is a important social activist 
and she is also a psychiatrist in the egyptian society she had published being the physician she is most interested in publishing novels she had written many novels based on women centered issues her most celebrated novel is woman at point zero in that she discusses about the practice of female genital mutilation which is very popular in the egyptian society egypt is, uh, is an islam based islam religion based country so the treatment when we talk about the status of women it is worse comparing with other nations the most important practice female genit uh, it is a curse of the society it is not a important practice sorry the female genital mutilation they may cut a part of the female genital organ of the woman when she uh, before she attains puberty they may cut the part of the genital genital part a part, a part of the genit genital portion of the woman would be taken before she attains the puberty it is one of the uh, practice which had been adopted it is a customary practice which is followed in the egyptian society she, as a woman writer she opposes as a social activities she raises slogan for that practice because it is not good for the health of the women so socially psychologically the woman is affected if she undergoes the practice of female genital mutilation el shadavi interprets the hegemony of a traditionally palocentric society male dominated society which is empowered by religion and masculinity in the novel women at point zero the author vehemently attacked the culturally dominated canons and she started to deconstruct the regressive traditions linked with patriarchal hegemony she is opposing the entire patriarchal structure because of the Uh, oppression of women in each and every aspect in each and every moment of the society she also interrogates the male chauvinistic culture that dehumanizes women women or women in the society of uh, egypt they were not at all treated as the human being in the male chauvinistic culture so she started to raise question for those things and uh, she focuses more on the marginalized in her works and she tries to give a voice for the voiceless women in islam so she has been described as a simon d bovier of the arab world because of her brilliant actions flora nawapa the other writer we are going to see she is the nigerian writer and uh, she is called as the mother of modern african literature she is a popular nigerian woman writer and she she is the first woman novelist in nigeria to publish all her works in english before her all the writers in nigeria were try were trying to publish their works only in their native tongue and the she creates a language of her own to secure her freedom from the oppression which means colonization and patriarchy already they have the nigerian country had been colonized and uh, she she is suppressed by the patriarchal structure so she creates her own language to liberate herself from these two oppressive powers all her works challenges a uh, hegemony of dominant patriarchal ideologies by securing an alternative feminist discourse and she anticipates for the contribution to for the development of post colonial nigeria she foresees the development of post post colonial nigeria representing nigerian women as nation builders 
uh, uh, like uh, the popular writer of Nigeria, old Soinga, Flora Nawapa, she also anti an anticipates to contribute something for the development of post-colonial post Nigeria by representing Nigerian women as the nation builders. In her popular book, she published the popular book, book Women Are Different in that she tries to show the supremacy of uh, female characters. There are so many female characters in the novel because the name, no, name of the novel is Women Are Different. There are so many female characters, Rose, Dora, Agnes, and others. There are many characters. They had been showed supremacy of their power over their male counterparts. And she has one strategy. So in all her fictions, she tries to reflect her strategy. What is that strategy? Uh, the creation of world must neither be dominated by men nor by men but by humans. So from this slogan of, uh, this is the popular slogan of, slogan of Flora Navapa, what, what does she come, come to say in, by using this slogan? The world, the creation of world must neither be dominated by men nor by women, but by humans. At least everyone must be treated, particularly women must be treated as humans. There are denial of basic rights for all the women in the society. They must be first considered as humans. So through her slogan, uh, strategic slo slogan, she shows that. Double marginalization is the term which is uh, directly and indirectly related to the subaltern studies. Already all the women are marginalized in the subaltern studies. Being born as a being born as a woman, she has been already kept aloof in the society, based on the race, caste, sex, nationality, and religion. All the women are going to be victimized and uh, in the as marginalized. So, that, so double marginalization denotes that as a woman already she is marginalized. Then with respect to race, caste, sex, nationality, and religion, they are going to be victimized and they are kept as marginalized. Alice Walker, she is the most popular subaltern feminist writer. All her fiction explores the cultural, national, linguistic backgrounds with a view to arriving at a transnational transcultural subaltern feminist aesthetic. When, when the subaltern writers try to explore their own uh, findings, their own experiences in the writing, automatically, uh, as a feminist writer, she explores the cultural, national, linguistic background as well as the transnational, because migration, once they started migration and they settled down in other nations, so transnational, Transcultural, they are they are already hybrid in their cultural practices. So transcultural, subaltern feminist aesthetic are brought out by her fiction, or brought brought out by her uh, in all her fiction. Most of the women consequently suffer with oppression, denial, erasure, persecution from patriarchal dominance. Double marginalization is a grotesque phenomenon faced by all subaltern women. The women who belong to certain ethnic groups, races, and castes, which are demarcated as terribly inferior. Maya Angelou, she is the most popular writer of subaltern studies. She had uh, published many works related to subaltern study. Phenomenal Woman is the most important poem of her. She has written the poem Phenomenal Woman. She is an American subaltern feminist poet. The poem Phenomenal Woman talks about liberal feminism. How a woman must be liberated. 
the entire poem talks about that the poetry shows her confidence though uh, towards her appearance as black woman though she appears as black she has much confidence she tries to reflect that in uh, in the poem phenomenal woman so now we are going to see the poetical some of the poetical lines from the poem phenomenal woman it is a fire in my eyes and the flash of my teeth the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet i hides it is a fire always she has fire in her eyes she writes like that the flash there would be always flash in her teeth there would be always swing in her waist and always she has joy in her feet though uh, she is a black woman she enjoys in all aspects still i rise is the other poem written by her it is the one of it is one of the best poems of her the poem still i rise describes the difficulties of blacks those who are living amidst the white community people it starts to explain the second wave feminism the poetical lines of the poem still i rise just lie sons with a certainty with a certainty of tides just like hopes springing high still i rise and she also says you may shoot me with your words you may cut me with your eyes you may kill me with your hatefulness but still like here i will rise here also she shows her confidence she so she shows her courageous policy still i rise is a popular poem written by her and uh, she also wrote the other poem caged bird in that she analyzes how the tradition and the history of the black people tied them to be submissive she longs for freedom in the poem the poetical lines but a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream his wings are clipped and his feet are tied so he opens his throat to sing this is the reality condition of the caged bird here uh, she explains her own situation being born as a black woman already she is marginalized she is kept alone so she imagines herself as a caged bird uh, she she aspires to get freedom liberation she wanted to get liberation not only she liberate herself she wanted to liberate herself she want she wants the entire black woman to be liberated from the clutches of male supremacy and maya angelou's poems are well known to champion the cause of all black women they are recognized for the empowerment of black women she utilizes her writing all her write ups are uh, uh, used as a tool for her to resist against the ideologies hegemonies methodologies which have silenced marginalized black women so she illuminated the lives of so many black people by her writing poetical lines by her poetical lines can the subaltern speak is the most uh, important book written by gayatri spiver so in that book uh, she discusses on class consciousness and subjectivity so it is a critic of western models the book can the subaltern speak is a critic of western models gayatri she tries to portray the thinking of the french intellectuals and the 20th century intellectuals uh, michel foucault and gilles deleuze in that book so and uh, she emphasizes how the western intellectuals uh, try to silence the voices of the subaltern by claiming to speak for the experience both subaltern studies and post colonial theories gain momentum in the third world countries because uh, the corollary effect of globalization so rewriting the history and cultural identity identities through the strategies separatism nativism cultural syncretism hybridity and assimilation undermines uh, 
several universal claims of post colonial theory so subaltern studies or uh, striving hard towards new horizons the women's empire women's em emancipation is considered as the most important aspect in all the uh, women centered studies women's em uh, emancipation is to make women understand the causes of discrimination against them women started to represent in political uh, women started to represent politically so the political representation of the subaltern women may seem like an escape from the exploitation of socio political aspect universal declaration of human rights was adopted to uphold the dignity of women all over the world in 20th 21st century the entire subaltern theme of writing have moved into issues which are more specifically post colonial karl marx on subaltern karl marx wrote published a book 18 brumar of louis bonaparte it is a popular book of karl marx the book try to describe the peasants peasant movements in french peasant society in 19th century according to karl marx the uh, oppressed people socio economic lifestyle is worse okay so they cannot act as a unified class conscious society because of the class the working class oppressed peasants cannot act as a unified class conscious society according to him the aesthetic representation and political realm or apply to the third world nations when the gap is wider spy work she also emphasizes the application of european theory uh, which try to represent the third third world women so the western theories could not be applied to the third world women under third world women policy third world women writers cannot follow european westernized theory according to spiver because their cultural setup their mind setup their social setup is entirely different so gayatri spiver stubbornly argues western theories western practices must not be applied to the third world women writings it cannot be justified also according to her point according to her view class plays a vital role in the discrimination of women in the developed the developing and under developing societies <laughs> spy work she expands the original definition of the term subaltern which is coined for the subaltern studies and uh, she mainly interpreted the ideas of the scholars like ranajit kuka ranajit kuka uh, he is a great scholar when he started to opine on subaltern studies he started to give his expression only on middle and upper class women not on lower class women so spy work she interpreted she criticizes she criticizes the ideas of ranajit guha and she raises her voice for the plight of women which had been already excluded in the anti colonial insurgency alice walker alice walker she is the most popular woman writer in subaltern studies she is also an afro american writer alice walker is a respected figure in the liberal political community because all her works are unconventional she is not trying to focus on the conventional writing she is very particular in conventional methods conventional way of practices and that she is focusing more on conventional unconventional writing because she herself is not conventional she 
directly says in all her writings and her unpopular views as a matter of pen principle and she is she is an opal bisexual and she is sympathetic towards all people of all sexualities ethnicities and races color purple is the most popular work of alice walker so the novel talks about the story of a young black woman who is fighting her way through not only racist white culture but also patriarchal black culture it is a story of a young black woman who fights her way not only for racist white culture but also she is dominated by racist white culture but but also she is very scary she is uh, very afraid of her her own patriarchal black culture so the novel color purple the novel color purple is a feministic work of an abused and uneducated african woman struggle for empowerment the protagonist she had been abused and uh, she is uh, she is an uneducated afro american woman and she struggles hard for her empowerment in the entire novel alice walker she uh, she had written many poems uh, and she crafts her poem as a call for new womanist order she talks about womanism like feminism she focuses more on womanism the everyday life experiences of black women had been kept under the concept under uh, in the theme womanism so alice walker is the first afro american feminist woman writer she talks about the new womanist order new womanist order in her poems so she is making a call okay she tries to make a call for the new womanist order in all her poems and she talks about democratic womanism based on democracy all all women must be liberated so she repeatedly talks in her poem about the democratic womanism and she always examine her choice to use the word dark dark always denotes the problems of women so she examines she always examines her choice to use the word dark in all her works particularly in her poetry and in all her novels and everyone can understand that alice walker is calling for the wisdom of women of color she is calling in the in all her works for the wisdom for the knowledge of women of color already they had been suppressed they had been marginalized they have been segregated in the society so he is calling for their wisdom they must stimulate their wisdom in order to acquire the empowerment she she makes a call to all the women of black in the society and she is strongly criticizing the controversial animalistic cruel stereotypes of black masculinity in her novel the color purple she strongly criticized controversial animalistic cruel stereotypes of black masculinity uh, so black masculinism had been treated had been criticized by her as most controversial they are behaving like animal they are not at all behaving like human beings they lacked in that and uh, there are certain cruel stereotypes for all the women in the society so the stereotypes which had been kept for the women in the society had been described by her as cruel since she is not conventional in her practice she is very unconventional in her way uh, according to her uh, any culture any custom any uh, behavior would not change the attitude of the woman okay. already she is born as a woman so these things would should not change the identity of the woman so that is the strong notion of the black woman writer alice walker 
so she she said uh, when when she talks about the stereotype of women it is very cruel uh, in the black masculine society so it is deeply discussed by all these things had been discussed by her in the novel color purple and uh, she talks about democratic womanism so this poetry had been read out by her uh, during the time of 2012 elections uh, when she attended the parliamentary session she read out the poem for the president during the time of presidential election in the year 2012 uh, this popular poem was composed by her was written by her she read out by herself in the american parliament the democratic woman is in the poem talks you may you you ask me why i smile she says you ask me why i smile when you tell me you intend in the coming national elections to hold your nose i am thinking of democratic socialist womanism perhaps who else knows so deeply how to share but mothers and grandmothers big sisters and aunts to love and adore both female and male not to mention those in between to work at keeping the entire community fed educated and safe democratic womanism democratic socialist womanism you ask me why i smile when you tell me you intend in the coming national elections to hold your nose so she is asking each and every citizen of the black society the black woman to enter into the active politics so politically she must be empowered according to her connotation so i am thinking of democratic and socialist womanism perhaps who else knows so deeply how to share but mothers and grandmothers big sisters how to share all these things you are all mothers we the women are considered only as mothers we had been treated we had been so called as grandmothers big sister we are all big sisters and aunts to love we have to protect we have to show our love we have to show our sympathy we have to we are known for adoring both female and male not to mention those in between to work at keeping the entire community fed educated and safe so we have to look after our offspring whether they are educated they are they are safe we have to look as a woman being born as a woman we have to look after each and everything so democratic womanism democratic socialism this is democratic womanism democratic socialist womanism she says like that she read these lines in the presidential elections uh, the year 2012 in america according to walker attaining political power and fundamental liberalism is mandatory all to all women in the patriarchal society already all the women are kept as objects uh, they had been kept as simply structures so so what is the tool to attain they have to attain political power when they want to liberate themselves fund fundamentally in the in the patriarchal society she says she calls each and every black woman for this to liberate themselves politically womanism is a social theory which is the concept created based on history and the experiences of women of color and the concept womanism says that culture of women is not an element of her femininity alice walker says when she interprets when she interprets the concept of womanism when she talks about womanism she says the culture of women must not be an element of her femininity culture is not intermingled culture should not be interrelated to the femininity according to her then we are going to see 
the other towering novelist of the black women writers tony morrison tony morrison is the other towering novelist of the black women writers she has produced many novels a uh, beloved mercy how bluest eye sula song of solomon tar baby or some of the most important novels written by her so many quotes of tony morrison became very popular the most important quote is given here if there is a book that you want to read but it has but it has not been written yet then you must write it this is the most important quote of tony morrison if there is a book that you want to read but it has not been written yet then you must write it if we want to write a book if you want to read a book if there is not a book like that it must be written by us bluest eyes is the most important inspiring work of tony morrison and uh, she published her last book recently she passed away she published her last work in the year 2019 the name of the work was the source of self regard selected essays features and meditations the source of self regard selected essays features and meditation it is the last book written by tony morrison which was published in the year 2019 it was one of the most inspiring works blue eyes like blue eyes eyes it is also one of the important work written by her the novel bluest eyes traces so in the novel bluest eyes protagonist is picola she is a black american basically she believes that she wanted to have blue eyes as a black american she anticipates to have she aspires to have blue eyes uh it is the key for the beautiful for being beautiful and finding social acceptance she wanted to be beautiful and uh, she wanted to be accepted by the society by she wanted to be accepted by everyone in the society basically the black people black women had not been accepted by everyone based on their color because of their color they had been hated they are uh, they are not liked by everyone in the society so the protagonist of the novel bluest eyes picola uh she want she she wants to be accepted by everyone in the society for that she wants to acquire bluest blue eyes which is not possible for her if she attains she she gets blue eyes then she would be very beautiful and she would be accepted by everyone in the society she prays for the bluest eyes because uh, that uh, the element the image of the bluest eyes represents the answer to the mystery of her life she faces so many problems so many conflicts in her life she thought because of her appearance if she wanted to she aspires to get blue eyes if she gets blue eyes in her eyes all her problems would be solved solved she thought like that when picola is granted her wish for blue eyes she can be able to obtain it by losing her identity finally picola she she is granted her wish for acquiring blue eyes now she is happy but finally she lost her identity there was a uh, there was one thing she can obtain the blue eye blue eyes how come it is possible for her to attain blue eyes if she loses her real identity if she loses her re real identity then only it is possible for her to get the blue eyes so she lost herself finally she lost her identity and she obtained the blue eyes at last the entire story talks about so the name of the story had been given as blue as eyes 
the the writer tony morrison tries to trace out the problem of women in the entire afro american society being born as a black woman being born as a black woman how much problem they are facing first of all they are not liking their own appearances they want to change their color it is not possible similarly the protagonist of the novel picola she wants to attain bluest blue blue eyes which is not possible uh, so it would be given to her once she loses her identity after losing the identity she received finally the blue eyes apart from gender bias are the most defining fa- factors in the novel the bluest eyes so there are mo- so many defining fa- factors in the novel uh, the famous novel written by tony morrison the bluest eyes apart from already we discussed the concept apart from gender bias bias towards gender they are determining factors in the novel tony morrison's last book the source of self regard selected essays features and meditation she published the book in the year 2019 in that she says it is this rattling i believe that it is this rattling i believe that affects the second point our uneasiness with our own feelings of foreignness our own rapidly praying sense of belonging she is longing uh, she is trying to find she is trying to find out her own identity and uh, she is raising her question it is this rattling i believe that affects the second point our uneasiness with our own feelings of foreignness even when we try to settle down in the land of america we feel alienated our feelings are uh, having foreign sense so we are feeling so foreigners we are not living in the native land our own rapidly praying sense of belonging to what we to what do we pay greatest allegiance family language group culture country gender religion race and if none of these matter or we are ban cosmopolitan or simply lonely so she raises the question for her identity in her last book the most important book the source of self regard selected essays features and meditations in that book she says like that how do we decide in other words how do we decide where we belong she is asking uh, her belongingness she doubts about her belongingness what conceives as that we do or put another way what is the matter with foreignness these are the most important words which had been taken by the last book of tony morrison the name of the book is the source of self regard selected essays speeches and meditation in that she says like this the book the popular book reveals the in depth thinking and philosophical regard for the world that made it possible for tony morrison to create scintillating effort effect in all her literary works and tony morrison she was the first black woman to receive the nobel prize in literature being born as a black woman writer she she received the nobel prize for literature for her noteworthy writers and uh, no doubt in the tony morrison is a guiding light and uh, she's a she's she's a moral spirit for the entire subaltern generation there is no doubt that with this i conclude my presentation thank you thank you for your patient listening thank you ma'am it was a wonderful presentation can we take some questions please yes ma'am yes um there are so many questions uh, i'll take few questions uh, here is a question 
don't you think blindly following the western theories forgetting our rich traditions has created a chaotic situation in the indian society where now the fashionable mantra is fighting patriarchy is yes, uh, obviously we must select some of the western theories we may try, we must try to follow western theory uh, though we try to give much more importance to the conventional method of writing traditional our own traditional methods of writing uh, according to so many scholars mixing up of western theories with our own traditional cultural setup with our own traditional uh, setup with, with our own traditional way of writing is not the new one so many uh, western uh, the nina subaltern writers they too followed they too uh, they too actually when they entered into the new concept from colonization into post colonialization post colonization they were uh, they actually they asked by us to get they they wanted to bring out they wanted to change their entire nation they wanted to change their nation to be empowered in such condition they are expecting to introduce they are very much interested to follow the western ideologies western theories though they are giving much more preference to the traditional methods and traditional way of practices similarly we can also do like that any other question ma yes yes uh, can you comment on hybridity as a weapon of post colonial women once again ma uh, can you comment on hybridity as a weapon of post colonial women hybridity yes hybridity following hybridity uh, culture is a weapon of post colonial women very good question uh, post colonial women when we try to analyze the aspect the lifestyle of post colonial women she is not following her own traditional culture automatically she tries to assimilate her own cultural uh, way then uh, she tries to behave in a different way so automatically the hybrid hybridity of uh, cultural practice hybridity culture it became a weapon it became a tool it uh, it became a support for the post colonial women uh when we talk about the socio political cultural aspect of uh, uh, post colonial women they wanted to look different uh, they do not want to go back they do not want to move back to their own tradition they want to give they want to throw light more on western policies western ideas in such condition bringing back the hybridity a uh, culture that means hybridity in in their own attitude in the cultural assimilation uh definitely the concept would pave way to the post colonial women it could act as a weapon to them though yes, some of the post colonial women though they give much more preference to the new culture new adopted migrated culture uh though they try to assimilate themselves with a new culture they they wanted to behave they wanted to show their ethnocentrism they wanted to be ethnocentric giving much more preference to their own culture so the ethnocentric culture of the women uh, would be analyzed in a different angle so definitely the concept hybridity in culture hybridity culture hybrid hybrid uh, way of culture would definitely act as a weapon for the post colonial women yes ma'am uh, there is another question uh, novel el sadawi is definitely right thinking about the discrimination faced by the egyptian women but almost all her works only show women as victims not as women who resisted keep yes. in mind there are uh many other egyptian writers who write about women who resist such discriminations in egypt so here is a question isn't sadawi trying to write 
to satiate the interests of western readers as uh, such tales of discrimination grabs readership last line ma'am can you repeat the last uh, line i just repeat the question again uh. isn't Sadawi trying to write us try to satiate the interest of western readers as such tales of discrimination grabs readership no actually for uh, all the women or victimized when we uh, read when we explore the writings of uh, sabalchan women writers all the women all the women are focusing on their issues uh, that means uh, particularly women are victimized they are facing more problems when we talk about shadabi she is a popular egyptian writer she tries to portray the women actually uh, based uh, already we discussed that uh, egypt is a islam based nation so all the islamic countries uh, all the world nations are popular for bringing male chauvinism uh, all the women had been oppressed when we talk about uh, the suppression of women here in egypt already uh, they are following islam religion uh, everything they try to adopt based on the religion the practices the cultural practices the customary ways everything would be based on the religion islam so women or uh, uh, not even considered as the human beings in that society so she particularly talks about the genital mutilation so it is a such an atrocious activity which is done uh, against the women uh, the a part of the genital uh, a part of the genital organ of the women would be removed during that uh, process so women or whether she likes or she do, doesn't like she must follow that practice so that is their patriarchal structure so the muslim women cannot raise their slogan against the male chauvinist uh, against the male dominated uh, society if they raise their slogan they would be kept aloof and uh, they would be treated as they are doing something against the religion and uh, their god so uh, she's uh, she, as a physician she cannot do uh, she she as a physician as a social activist she tries to solve so many problems of the women in a different connotation and uh, there are many uh, women or uh, kept as victimized and uh, there are so many rebel they, uh, they are starting to raise their slogan so many western theories so though they they try to apply the so many western theory though uh, westernization the concept westernization entered into the land of uh, 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 egypt they are very uh, pious towards the religion and uh, uh, their own practices okay so so according to her view most of the women are victimized they cannot raise their slogan the next question ma'am yes uh, what view does gayatri swivak take toward anti positivist feminists and western theorists once again ma'am what view does gayatri swivak take towards anti positivist feminists and western theorists Gayatri Swivak actually uh, she talked about Indian women, Indian culture uh, in her popular book and the Sabalchan speech. And uh, when she talks about, uh, she told uh, her views on the practice of sati, which is against the women. Actually, we know the meaning of sati. If the women women has to adopt. she has to uh, enter into the fire once her husband is uh, when he is no more automatically she has to die that is the rule of the uh, society when the sati like practices prevailed in those days so she is opposing she is opposing those things in the society uh, being born as a woman 
being born as an indian woman she knows india is known for pluralistic culture uh, india is uh, segregated into so many states each state has its own culture each state has its own linguistic practices in such condition each regional writer would be focused here so each regional subaltern writer if we consider a regional subaltern writer how come it is possible to apply the western theory on the particular writers work so she uh, she is against uh the uh, she is not ready to accept those things she uh, neglected uh, she is not ready to accept those western theory she she is not ready to accept those western theory in the application of her uh, indian works particularly she is not uh, accepting that yes ma'am uh one participant is asking about can we bring the native american women writers under the subaltern women studies please shed some light in this field native american women writers under the subaltern women studies there are so many native american women writers actually when we talk about um, native american women writer there are no native people in america uh america was also once colonized so there is no native people in america uh so many uh, migrant people started to settle down in that uh, land similarly uh these uh, subaltern writers they started to move uh, they started to move towards america they migrated from different parts of the world so there is no native american women writers um no uh, shall i uh, continue with the next question yes ma'am yes ma uh, can you please explain the difference between black feminism and dalit feminism the difference between black feminism and dalit and feminism? dalit feminism Uh, more or less uh, this is the same because black feminism black uh, already we discussed the ordeals of black people the black women in the uh, subaltern society similarly the same kind of problem had been faced by the dalit in the indian society so they are oppressed they had been kept aloof in the society Uh, that there are so many popular writers in dalit in dalit writing similarly we discussed so many black women writers so double marginalization already we discussed the concept double marginalization being born as a woman already she had been discriminated so based on her color based on her race she is again she is going to be discriminated this is nothing but double marginalization there uh black feminist writers talk about uh, they raise their slogans uh for being born as a woman they had been suppressed they had been dominated by the white men uh based on their color they had been segregated so they are raising their voice for uh they are raising their voice for being born as a woman uh, sorry when they have been oppressed by men they are raising their voice and uh, based on their color when they had been segregated they are automatically opposing the white community similarly here the dalit women writers there are so many dalit women writers bama kar her popular novel karthu already she is a dalit woman being born as a dalit woman how much problem as a woman basically she faces so many problems being born as a dalit woman how much problem she faces how she had been kept aloof how she had been alienated in the society that had been beautifully brought out by her uh, in the novel karthu so black feminism and dalit feminism more or less same and uh, both black women and dalit women they are stri striving hard for their denial of basic rights in the society they had been uh, uh, 
uh, they are bringing they are trying to trace out their own autobiographical experiences in the writers because so uh, get back their own rights yes because to get back their own rights yes uh, i'll take another question um, you mentioned regarding the identity crisis uh, what did you mean by identity crisis don't you think modern men is also suffering from this definitely modern modern men or women man uh, a modern man modern man is mentioned modern man is also facing identity crisis yes if we can accept uh because uh, nowadays uh, in the post colonial view all the women are educated they are raising their voice in so many situations so already egalitarian society is created uh, they are they are striving hard to get back their already they received equal status with men so in such condition women sorry like women men is also facing so many crises uh like feminism uh we can talk about androcentrism there are so many problems related to men so they are they try to explore their own uh, issues in that particular writers uh they are there are certain expectations for the women so men also expect women to be like that when the expectations are more automatically there are so many problems when there are no more expectations i think uh, uh, we can we can solve this issue uh, Yes, so ma'am. the identity crisis would be solved then okay uh, there is a question from the youtube viewer uh, ma'am what are your comments on the book the scarlet letter wherein the character is shown cruel treatment for committing adultery and she only gains her respect and character by doing charitable things the question is what are your comments on the book the scarlet letter can you repeat the question yes yes one? sure uh, what are your comments on the book the scarlet letter darren the character is shown cruel treatment for committing adultery and she only gains her respect and character by doing charitable things okay uh, actually being born as a woman already uh, we are when we talk about our indian culture there are certain expectation for all the women women must be like this not only in india through all the all the world nations all the entire world literature focuses women in a different angle in different view women must be focused women must uh, must be kept like that so when any character from any literature any woman character she tries to cross her margin she tries to cross her boundary uh particularly when we talk about extra marital relationship which is called as adultery social she automatically loses her social status first she loses her social status when she is loses the when she loses her social status then automatically she is affected psychologically when she is affected psychologically then there would be lot of problems automatically she loses everything so that is the reason uh, when she wants to uh, recover when she wants to come back to her own level that means when she uh, that means uh, she tries to solve all the issues all the problems in that angle she wants to prove herself as an insane and uh, she is uh, uh, as a that means uh, her purity must be proved by her at any angle so that is a solution yes uh, i'll take one more question how is feminism different from feminism how is womanism different from feminism which is more political how womanism different from feminism, feminism. what is the other what is which the is other more one? political which is more political whether womanism or feminism that is a question 
uh, feminism is more political because womanism is centered around the, the real day-to-day -day life situations of black women. Whereas feminism, it talks about socio-cultural, political empowerment of women. So feminism is uh, uh, more important. It means uh, it becomes more political than humanism. Um, we could see so much of appreciation for your representation, ma'am. So, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes, yes, excellent session, very clear presentation, uh, very nice talk. Uh, you could see very informative session like that, uh, very interesting. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, ma'am, and you are patiently answering all the questions. And it was really an informative session. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I thank all the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I thank all the participants for their patient listening. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you, ma'am.